Hey, welcome guys. I'm Pastor Rex, Senior Pastor at Pursuit Church. I want to thank you for joining us for this week's teachings from our Sunday worship service. If you would like more information, you can find us online at PursuitNazarene.org. My prayer is that God will grow your faith through the hearing of his word. So let's listen in. Here we go. We're going to continue in our series in the book of Genesis. And I don't know if you have been reading through the book of Genesis as we've been discovering this book. We're not going to be able to read every single word in the book of Genesis in the, the short time compared to how much time there could be in there. We're going to be covering it for about 10 or so weeks in total. But I encourage you, dig into the book of Genesis. And if you have been digging in, then we are coming into around Genesis 10 and 11. Today we're talking about the Tower of Babel. And thanks to the Tower of Babel, the world now has over 7,000 languages. Yet, God desires every one of us to have one fluent language, and that's the dialect of worship. We're going to talk about that today. So if we're going to, as we unpack this truth, this is where I want us to land today. I'm going to give it to you now in case you zone out and then come back to us a little bit later. I'll say welcome back, but I'm going to give it to you now, okay? The point of our lives is to point to God. The point of our lives is to point to God. Now, as before we read Genesis 11, where we find the Tower of Babel, if you have been reading and you get to chapter 10, you realize that, okay, we came from creation. God created this amazing world, everything in it, including you and I, in his own image in Genesis 1. We found out a little bit more detail in Genesis 2 of how he made Adam and Eve and the relationship that we were designed to have with him in the Garden of Eden. What a blissful, amazing time. But the problem was is that sin came in through the tempter, Satan. And Eve and Adam both gave into that temptation, they disobeyed God, and they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and that brought a division between humanity and God. In fact, from that point, ever since then, there has been a problem. There's been an issue. There has been a lot of issues. There's been a lot of problems. So you got a problem with me? Yeah, I got a problem with you, and I have a problem with Adam. Thanks a lot. I mean, since then, there's a problem. We all have problems. There's a problem between man and woman, between man and the earth, or between animals and people, between us and God. There's a separation that occurred from the fall. But you know what I love about God and the story all throughout Genesis is that God does not stop pursuing us with his love. Even from the fall, yes, they had to get kicked out of the Garden of Eden, but God pursued them. God gave them everything they needed to continue to have a right relationship with him, even though now there's a lot more issues and conflict in the world. God doesn't stop. I love that as we go through this story, the stories of Genesis. It speaks of God's love for you and I, for all of humanity. He doesn't stop pursuing us. And if you've continued to read, you recognize that Cain... And Abel, that, that turned out pretty bad. Cain killed Abel because of his jealousy of the sacrifice, turned into a sin of, of murder, and then the curse on Cain. And then we find out that generations later, the earth had become so corrupt that God it was actually sorrow. The, the sin of man brought upon the sorrow of God, and he was so sorrowful that he made man, and he decided, I'm going to start all over again. But there was one man, Noah, who walked with the Lord. And we recognize that faithfulness with the Lord, man, that's, that's where it's at. And so he saved Noah and his kids and his, the, the wife of his kids and Noah's wife. They all got into the ark and God protected them and saved them. And they flooded the earth. And after they were floating for like a year-ish, everything on the face of the earth died except for what remained in the ark. And that was the animals and Noah and his family remained secure in the ark. Points us to Jesus who is our ark, our personal salvation. So the waters go down. They go out, the rainbow. There's an altar. Noah comes out and builds an altar to the Lord, recognizing that God was the Savior for him and his family and worships him, and God brings the rainbow. And then if you keep reading, you're going to go into chapter 10. And chapter 10 talks about how Noah's kids had kids. And those grandkids of Noah in that generation, and it gives them all these kinds, it gives them their names. And then it says that they scattered around the world in their own languages. And then you get to chapter 11, and you recognize it's the Tower of Babel, and you go, well, hold on a second. Didn't they already scatter? Well, here's what's happening. Moses has given us the account of what happened, and then he's, he's backing up and saying, this is how they got scattered. Okay, so if you go through chapter 10, and then you get to chapter 11, you're a little confused. It's because Moses has kind of given you the, the here's what happened, and now let's back up, and here's why it happened. So this is chapter 11, the story of the Tower of Babel. So we're going to look at the first couple verses, and we're going to break it down. Here we go. 
Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 and 2 say this. Now the whole world had how many languages? One language. And a common speech. As men moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. So we find out here that they're on the move. They're looking for a place to settle. And they are gathered together under one language, under a common speech. To this point, it's one language. And as the story unfolds, if you already know the story, you realize that one language does not work very well for mankind. But we're not, we're not there yet. You know, today we speak over 7,000 languages across the world. 7,000. That's, that's amazing. That's remarkable. And it's interesting, I looked a little bit more into that, and 2,000 of these languages have fewer than 1,000 speakers. So of the 2,000, of the 7,000, 2,000 only have 1,000 people that speak that language. Wow. Now, I don't know how many languages you speak. How many of you speak at least one? Okay. <laughs> Some of you aren't sure. <laughs> I don't know. Every other language, I don't know. <laughs> when I go to the dentist, I'm not thinking anything about it. Um, some of you, how many speak two languages? Pig Latin does not count. But you, okay. So bilingual. How many would say you're fluent in two languages? Okay. Okay, that's awesome. Um, three languages, four languages. Okay, we start to slow down a little bit there. I happen to, I am bilingual in Espanol, también hablo Espanol, and English. But I know some other words that I picked up in my journeys as a missionary kid and in some of my travels in mission trips. So I speak English and Spanish, but I also know how to say in Portuguese, I don't speak Portuguese, which is very handy. <laughs> Ele não fala português. As soon as someone says that, they go, oh, fala português. No, no, el no fala português. Oh, fala. And they're like, just because I have the accent and I said it right, they think, oh, you really do. You're just kidding. You do. <laughs> There's an Indian dialect in Peru in, among the Agaruna Indians, and it's called uh, Agaruna. And they will say, Daming um, which means, what is your name? Or, God bless you, is Apahui Yampakti. Can you say that with me? Apahui Yampakti. God bless you too. Thank you. <laughs> Next time someone sneezes, I expect you to go, Baha, Apahui Yampakti. Okay? <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> no, bless you. I don't know what. I traveled to South Africa in 2006, and I learned there's a language there spelled X O S A, Mosa. It's a click in the back of the throat, Mosa. And I learned how to say, God bless you, in Mosa. And it's, Un cose umbisise. Un cose umbisise. It's a little uh, in the back of your throat as you're saying, okay? We might think that's weird, but that's normal for them. Now, in Paraguay, they speak Guarani. Interesting, the, uh, the, the word for water in Guarani is, uh. <laughs> I wonder how they came up with that word. Think about that for a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, right. Yeah. So I thought we'd have a little bit more fun with some languages. And how about take a language quiz? Are you ready for your quiz today? Did you guys study? Okay, so here we go. The first question is this. What's the most popular language in all the world? Is it A, French, B, Russian, C, Mandarin, Chinese, or D, English? What do you think? Something French, D, okay. All right, how many of you said B? How many of you said C? Okay, the answer is C, Mandarin, Chinese. Good job. Over... 1.213 million people speak that language. Wow. Billion. What did I say? Billion. I'm the one putting the quiz on here, okay? Come on. I need some glasses. Oh, yeah, there are three more zeros. Thank you. All right, next. Here's our next one. Okay, here we go. What's the second most popular language? A, Spanish, B, English, C, German, or D, French? How many French? How many want, want a French? I mean, how many think it's French? Okay. All right. How many think it's Spanish? How many English? Alemania? German? That's Spanish for German. That wasn't German for German. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Nadine. I don't know what it is. All right. The answer is Spanish. 400 and, over 442 bill, million. <laughs> I almost said it. I messed myself up. People speak it. All right, number three. What is the third most popular language? Is it German, French, Russian, or English? How many of you think it's French? It's been up there for uh, French. It's about time we get this right, right? Okay, the answer is English. Just kidding. It's not French. Over 378 million people speak English. Third most common language. All right, let's keep going since we're on a roll with this language quiz. 
A language vanishes, this is remarkable, vanishes from the face of the earth every, is it 30 days? Is it 14 days? Is it every six months or every year a language vanishes from the face of the earth? What do you think? You think every year a language vanishes? How many think it's actually every 30 days that a language vanishes? Uh, that's pretty crazy, okay. Um, how many say it's 14? 14, okay, let's see what the answer is. Every 14 days, a language vanishes from the face of the earth. Wow. Did they just learn about it? All right, number five. So by the way, how this might work is uh, there'll be a generation, a tribe, and the generation dies off, and there's one elder left that only speaks that dialect of that language. And when he dies, so does the language. How many languages have only one speaker left in that language? Is it 18, 5, 37, or D, 52? How many languages have only one speaker left? So are there 52 languages with one speaker left? Or are there five languages or A, B, or C. How many say A? How many say B? How many say C? How many say D? 52. The answer is A. There are 18 languages that only have one speaker left. These languages are on the verge of extinction. And let me give you three of these that are examples of these languages. Uh, the next slide shows us that there are, uh, these are just to name a few. As of 2018, Patwin from North America is uh, one speaker left, one elder of that left. Uh, Tinigua from South America, that's one person who speaks that language right now. Um, what's that? Who does he talk to? Good question. <laughs> I never thought about that. Uh, and then in Africa, there's an example, Bikya, I think is how you might say it. I don't know. I'm not that guy or gal, and so I'm not sure. Really interesting. I, okay, I may not have the answer because I'm not a linguist expert. These are because nobody understands them. <laughs> All right. That was easy. Come on, what else you got? <laughs> okay. All right. So let's keep going in the story, shall we? We've only gotten through two verses. Here we go. <laughs> Here we go. Verse 3, chapter 11, says this. So this one language group of people, in verse 3, they said to each other, because they could still understand each other. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used bricks instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered all over the face of the earth. So what do they want to do? They want to make a name. They want to build a tower and they want to build a city. I think this is where the story of the three little pigs was invented because the new technology came about. The brick, right? The brick changed everything for them. And so they realized that the straw could be blown down by the big bad wolf and the sticks could be blown down, but the bricks, oh, those worked. And so thus the brick became um, very popular and they started using that. So what they do, let's build a city. Now that we've got something substantial, let's build a city. And they started to build a city. They wanted to, to bring it all in. But the problem here is that I find there's two sins of the city that are being committed. There's two sins in the city. Now, by the way, if you're, you're welcome to take notes, there's no fill in the blank today, but there is a blank sheet with some scripture references in the bulletin for you if you want to look back at some of this stuff later on. Um, I encourage you to do that. But there's two sins of the city. And these two sins all revolve around me, us, we. It's all a selfish motive behind these two sins. There is no, notice there's no mention of God in their conversation. Now, this is only two generations after Noah. Noah was faithful. In fact, Noah was the only one saved on the planet. He was faithful. He walked faithfully with the Lord. He was a righteous man. And two generations later, these people aren't even considering God when they talk about building a city. I mean, Noah got out of the ark and immediately he built something. And the first thing he built was unto the Lord. It was an altar unto the Lord to recognize that God was the one that had saved them, to thank them. And that's what he built. And two generations later, they're building without even considering God in the equation. The two sins here that they're committing 
is the sin of self-preservation is the first one. They wanted to build a city. They wanted to build security. If you notice in this verse, the New Living Translation says it like this, come let us build a great city for ourselves. With a tower that reaches to the sky, this will make us famous. Keep us from being scattered over the world. It had nothing to do with the recognition that God was God and that he was wanting the best for them. Self-preservation was their first sin. Let's build security for ourselves. And you know what? We're not too far away from that in our own lives. We want to build our own security and just forget that God is even a part of the equation. We're just going to take care of us and we're going to build up for ourselves our own, our own security and our own, our own safety. And we're going to have safety nets outside of that safety and we're going to do all that work. And we may even think, what, what is God going to be there for? I mean, I, I've got this. I can take care of all this. The problem here with this self-preservation and sin of the city is that there's no reliance on God. There, there is, the worship to God becomes completely unnecessary because they're taking care of their own needs. And they're pushing God completely out of the picture because we don't need him. An, an offering, we don't need to build an build a, a altar and give offering to him because we're the ones providing for ourselves. But God, God's not giving this to us. We're doing this, so we're not going to give back to God because we're even not even recognizing that he's the one that's gifting us every half because we, we're preserving ourselves. We're going to build our own safety and security. The question here is, how well do you think this will work for them and for us to consider that God's not even a part of the equation? How well this, will this work for us to recognize, well, God doesn't provide us anything and we're just going to build, build security within ourselves God is going to provide? I don't know. We'll, we'll see how that goes. That's a little bit too elusive of an idea. I'm going to build security for myself. The second sin of the city is this, self-edification. The sin of self-edification. They're going to build a tower, and we're going to make a name for ourselves. I mean, it's going to go way up in the sky. We're going to go, look at what we did. Wow. And we're going to build, we are going to be the ones to try to reach to the heavens. We're going to do everything in our own will, with our own power, and here's our way to get to the heavens. We are going to become our own God. Look at us. Look what we can do. Completely eliminating the need to worship a God and recognize that he's there. The problem, the worship of self. They wanted to worship themselves. They wanted to see how awesome that they were. They were finding their meaning and happiness and making themselves a bigger deal than they really are. But we're not too far from that, are we? You know, where we can really make a bigger deal than we really are, and we can begin to push God out of our lives and say, well, God, I mean, I'm the one that did this, really. I mean, you know, I got skills, right? And I can... But who gave us those skills? Who gave us the opportunity to live and breathe and move and work? It's our Lord. I love what John Piper has to say about this. He says, God's will for human beings is not that we find our joy in being praised, but that we find our joy in knowing and praising Him, God. Pride's a scary thing. It feels so powerful, doesn't it? It feels like, yes, I'm going to puff myself up and it feels like we have all this power and pride can just inflate. And we all this, we start floating off the ground. We feel like we're so cool and bigger than we really are. Man, it feels so powerful. But the reality is, is that pride is super ugly. And it's very, very destructive for you and I and even this story in Genesis 11. Pride pushes everyone away. Instead of what love does, love draws in. Pride just pushes everybody away. I got this. Look at me. I'm top dog. I don't need you. You can give me your advice if you want, but I already have the answer. So go ahead, blah, blah, blah. Okay, but here's what I'm going to do. Pride is so ugly, but yet we feel like it's so powerful. It lures us in. So how do we fight against pride and self-centeredness? How do we push those things away? If we recognize that it scattered the, the uh, people of the town of, of Babel, if it scattered them and God wasn't pleased with that, then how can we guard against pride and self-centeredness? I came across this really cool article by John Maxwell, and he gives four simple steps on how to push back against self-centeredness. The first thing is this, recognize and admit that you're prideful. Now, that's hard for someone who's prideful to admit, right? That's why they're prideful, right? Because they don't admit that they're prideful. But it's difficult, yet a necessary step. So here might be a little test for you. If you think that you're not conceited at all, you probably are pretty conceited. Okay, and so let's just, if you think, oh, no, I'm not, 
Uh, you might want to, okay? All right. Step number one, recognize that you're prideful. Here's the next step in fighting against self-centeredness is this. Express your gratitude. You know how powerful thankfulness and gratitude is? I mean, it is an amazing tool that God has given us. Being able to say thank you to other people and to God for what he has done, it takes the attention off of ourself and onto the blessings that we're receiving, onto the people that we are blessed to be around. When we say thank you for that, we recognize that did not come from me. That came from somebody else. And it takes our attention off of ourselves onto others and onto God who provides. So express your gratitude to fight against self-centeredness. The third way is this, practice servanthood. Serving others takes the attention off of self and reminds us that we're a part of something bigger. Now, I love the way that we practice that as a church of pursuit. And we need to continue to find out ways more to serve our community. Our Thanksgiving meal is a great opportunity for that. I wish that the, the food line was even longer than it is every year. Why? Because I love seeing every different kind of person with a spoon or a spatula or tongs just serving the food, serving the food. And it's an amazing picture of serving no matter who comes through that line. Because why? God loves every one of us, and so we should love everyone as well. And I, I love that. I love that that's a picture that we, we actually flesh out when it comes to our Thanksgiving community meal. Serving others takes the attention off of ourselves and recognize that, oh, it's not all about my little world, right? There's other people out there. It's not just me. Check this quote out. Love this. A person who is truly great is always willing to be little. A person who is truly great is always willing to be little. I really think that before anybody goes into any career at all, that they should have a janitor job at least one in their life, one time in their life. Because it helps us understand that, you know what, no matter what job you are, if you go use the bathroom, you better be thankful to the person that cleans it. And clean up after yourself is normally what, right? I really think, I, I believe that. And that's, that's not just true in the work world, but in everything else. A person who's truly great, they're really okay, and it's, they're willing to be little. Jesus himself modeled this in his teachings and to his leadership with his disciples. Can you remember right towards the end of his life before the cross, he met with his disciples and he wrapped a towel around his waist and he got down on his hands and knees and he washed his disciples' feet. This is their rabbi. This is their teacher, the one they call Lord. And he's doing what the lowest of servants does. He's practicing this idea of serving and he says, I want you to do this very thing to others. Why? Not because everybody has dirty feet but because he's teaching them to recognize that I'm okay with the little tasks. I'm okay with these lowly tasks. It communicates love and servanthood. And by the way, it also pushes away from self-centeredness because the love that God gives us is for others. It's not for us to keep. And the fourth step that we can take is to laugh at yourself. That's a great, great step. Laugh at yourself. I love this old saying, blessed are they that laugh at themselves or they shall never cease to be entertained. <laughs> you know, prideful people can take themselves way too seriously. And by laughing at yourself, you see sometimes how absurd and ridiculous you really are, right? <laughs> laugh at yourself. It's okay. Kind of, you know, it, when other people laugh at you, laugh with them, okay? Don't laugh. Don't get all upset and, I didn't want to hear, you know? It's okay. Laugh at yourself. It really helps with that. And I'm going to add to this list that I read, and we'll finish with this a little bit later on, but worship to our God fights pride and pushes away self-centeredness is the worship to our God. You see, self-centeredness is not a character trait that God designed in you. It is not something that he put in you. We are not created and put on this earth to look and worship at self and to take care of self, rather to worship God and allow him to take care of us. So what happens next in our story? Let's go back into Genesis chapter 11. We're picking up in verse 5. Verse 5 says this, But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord said, If as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing that they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let's go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there all over the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there the Lord scattered them over the face of the earth. 
Now, I want to be clear, this is a picture of God's mercy and grace, not a picture of a mean God that wants to just confuse everybody. Because I firmly believe God is not a God of confusion. By the way, if you're seeking the Lord in something and you're confused, that is not the voice of the Lord. The Lord is very clear. And if you're in his word, he will direct you to what that decision is. And our God is not mean just going, oh, let me see how we can mess with these people. Let's confuse them and, and give them all these language and they'll scatter everywhere. This is really a picture of God's mercy and grace. Now, before I tell you how that is, let me make sure we understand what mercy is. Mercy is this. Mercy is God not punishing us as our sins deserve. Not punishing us as our sin deserve. That's mercy. And grace is this. It's receiving a blessing from God despite the fact that we deserve what we deserve. So this is a picture of God's mercy and grace. How is that? By confusing the people and scattering them all over the world, he keeps them from becoming the corrupt nation that he just had, had his justice shown on by flooding the entire earth. He knew what they were capable of. Not that they would have built some tower all the way to heaven and pushed God off of his throne and said, it's me, and then somebody pushed him off. No, it's me, and then, no, it's me. That wasn't it. It was, he knew what they were, he knew that what would happen with that corrupt generation if they continued to be self-centered and so prideful and pushing God out, he knew that that was not a good thing. And so he scattered them in order to preserve them because he's a merciful God. He's a God that's full of grace. God is drawing them actually to himself by scattering them away. I'm going to say that again. God actually is drawing those people back to himself by scattering them away. And he does it through discipline in our lives today. See, God's love for his people is often shown through his discipline. Did you know that? We don't like to talk about that or hear about that because discipline such, sounds just like, ah, I don't want to be disciplined. But I want to read for you in Hebrews 12, 6 through 11, that God does discipline those he loves. Listen to this. For the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes each one he accepts as his child. As you endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. Don't miss that. Whoever heard of a child who is never disciplined by his father? Well, we have seen that. We have heard of that. And it's not very good, right? If God doesn't discipline you as he does all of his children, it means that you are an illegitimate and you are not really his child at all. Since we respected our earthly father who disciplined us, shouldn't we submit even more to the discipline of the father of our spirits and live forever? For our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years, doing the best that they knew how, but God's discipline is always, say this word with me, good for us. Say that with me. But God's discipline is always good so that we might share in his holiness. God's discipline for us is because he loves us, and because he loves us, he wants to, us to live that holy life out. And so recognize that in this, in this story, it looks like, oh, he's being so harsh. Why would he do that? God loves his people, and he will bring about things in our lives that may cause pain. Like, that does not feel good. That hurts. And what do we want to do? We want to run from that pain. We want to run from that rebuke. We want to run from those things that might bring some type of discipline in us because nobody wants to be disciplined, but recognize that God's love is why he does that. My question to you is what areas of your life is God bringing discipline in you right now? It may be an attitude of your heart. It may be the way you feel or look towards somebody. It might be the way that you handle, handle your time alone. It may be the way that you are cultivating your, your family as you raise them or treat your wife or your, treat your husband. It may be the type of work ethic that you have at, at home and at work. But only you can answer this right now. What areas of your life is God bringing discipline? Heads up, it's an area that hurts. It's an area that doesn't feel good, but you know the result is godly. The next question about that is this. With that in your mind, are you open to God's discipline? Because you can run from that and not accept it and just go, I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to become self-centered and I'm going to become self-preserved. I'm going to just do this all myself. I don't need your discipline, Lord. Are you open to his discipline? And if you are, you're going to kind of stay right there where the Lord is teaching you what he's doing in your life. And then with that in mind, do you recognize it as God's love for you? And if you don't, I want you to 
Make a mental shift. Whatever it is that the Lord is bringing discipline in your life, recognize it because he loves you. And he has a great plan for you. You can't see that right now. You can't. Kids can't see when they're being disciplined or punished. They can't see that this is for, for a better tomorrow, right? To, to have children that when they're adults are respectful to the people around them and contribute to society and love the Lord and love other people. They don't see that right then when they're being disciplined for their disobedience. But we as parents, we, that's why we discipline. Because we know what's to come. And God, man, he sees even a bigger picture. Recognize that it's his love for you. And now what are you going to do next? What are you going to do next? What is it that the Lord is doing? And how are you going to respond with that discipline in your life? In verse 8 of chapter 11, God confuses languages and he scatters the people all over the earth. That was his discipline to the sin that was happening in the city. Because here's the deal. God is more, is up to more than just confusing and scattering. He really is. If it was just left at that, it'd be like, oh, well, what kind of God is that? He's He's, way, he's up to way more than just confusing and scattering. He is setting up for the salvation of every person. He's setting up for salvation of a diverse world through one way, through one truth, through one source of life, and that source of life is Jesus Christ. The confusion of Babel allows the clarity and the power of the gospel of Christ to be heard. The confusion of Babel allows the power and the clarity of the gospel of Jesus Christ to to be heard. The gospel can transcend any people group. It can go to the remote areas of any tribe or nation, and it can speak good news to any man or woman, young or old. It brings salvation to anyone who accepts it. Do we believe that? Do we know that? I'm telling you, that's the good news of Jesus Christ. The truth of the gospel is one truth. It's one way. It's one truth. It's one life. There is not any other but Jesus Christ. I love the commission that Christ gives the disciples before he ascends and says, I'm coming back for you. His commission was to go there and make other disciples, not just in your town, but in the town outside of your town, and then in the town outside of that town, and keep going and going and going. You are to make disciples. Don't stop right here, but continue on. That's our mission as a church. We are missional as a church. We recognize that we have good news and it's part of our responsibility, yours and mine, to share that good news with other people. That's who we are. And you know what? The diversity of language actually kind of commissions us a little bit more. Doesn't? There's a challenge there. And we go, we want every, we are so motivated by this mission that there are organizations exclusive that, that exist to translate the Bible or to send missionaries into what we call creative access areas because we want God's word to be heard and we want the gospel to be preached. I love organizations like Wycliffe and Bible Society and Pioneer Bible Translators. There's many more than that that make it their, their mission and vision to translate the Bible. Do you know that of the 7,000 languages, at least one portion of scripture has been translated for 3,312 of these languages? Almost half of these languages, some portions of scriptures. And the complete Bible has been translated into 670 languages. I love the mission we have, that we take God seriously, that even though we're scattered and many languages are preached, that we have this commission to go and make disciples. And the love of God in us and the love for other people and our heart that breaks for the lost fuels that commission. The sin of man brings confusion and separation, but the good news draws us together for one purpose, and that is to glorify God. I'm going to say that again. This is so important for us. The sin of man brings confusion and separation. That's true back then. It's true right now. Sin of man brings confusion and separation. But the good news of Jesus Christ draws us together for one purpose, to glorify God. Would you say that with me? To glorify God. Say it. To glorify God. That's our common purpose. Because God's more interested in unifying our hearts than seeing how much we can build with our hands way more interested in the unifying our hearts than seeing what we can do with our hands. We need to strive for this Christian unity. And Ephesians 4 talks about this Christian unity. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. That's every one of us, guys. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is, say these words with me, one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. Keep, can, keep going with me. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, 
one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. We serve an audience and worship an audience of one. That is our Lord. All that to say, the point of our lives is to point to him. The point of our lives is to point to him. The point of your life is to point to the Lord. We've got to fight against what the world tells us. So just take care of yourself. Just worship yourself. You've got this. You're prideful. You can take... You, no, we need the Lord. And our purpose is to point to him. If we eliminate him, we eliminate our purpose. Our one God. In our lives, point to him. In your friendships, serve as Christ serves you. Serve your friends. That points to God. In your jobs, work for the Lord and not for man by doing your very best in your job. Point to him. Point to him with your money. Give it away. Hold your hands right side up and open and recognize it's all from God. God, this is yours we can point to him with our finances by saying, here, Lord, use it for your glory and not for mine. In your dating relationship, men, you are dating the daughter of a king. So God is your heavenly father-in-law, so to speak. Treat her with honor, and by doing that, you point to him. Women, support and love and respect the man that you're dating and look to God first to meet your emotional needs and then recognize that the partner that God has given you, together you will honor the Lord. What about your time at home? What about your downtime? What about me time? Look at that as God's time, not me time. Even all the things that you do at home in that downtime, recognize this is the Lord's, not mine. Honor him with what you watch. Honor him with what you think about. Honor him with what you read. What you do is spend time as a family in your community. Honor the Lord. Everything you do, may it point to him. How about your body? Think of your body as an instrument for God. Think of it as an opportunity. How well do I have, am I doing at at sharpening this tool for the Lord, this instrument for the Lord? What am I doing to take care of this so that I can continue the legacy of the Lord through my life? What about your mouth? You encourage other people. By doing that, you know, you point to the Lord. Your purpose with your mouth, when you encourage others, points to the Lord. When you tear each other down, it does not point to Jesus. Do you tell God that you love him? Do you use your mouth to say, Lord, thank you? Do you worship him with your lips? Here's my challenge and encouragement to us right now. Let your lips praise the God that made them. In any language, from any tribe or any people, may God be praised. John receives a vision and a revelation of a time when all men and angels will fully acknowledge God and worship. This is what it says in Revelation. Listen to this. After this, I looked and beheld a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all the tribes and people and all the languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb, who's clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice saying, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all of the angels were standing around the throne and all around the elders and the four living creatures and they fell on their faces before the throne and they worshiped God saying, Amen. Blessings and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and forever. Say it with me. Amen. Amen. We're going to recognize that our point is to point to him and we're not going to let this day go by or any other day go by without saying, God, I worship you. I honor you. We lift your name up because that's the point of my life is to point to you. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace today. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed. Hey, thanks for joining us today. I hope that you have been encouraged and challenged to pursue a deeper faith in God through what you've heard. If there's any way that we can help you in your new faith in Jesus Christ, please contact us at PursuitNazarene.org and we would love to talk with you. May God bless you this week and hope to see you back again soon. Thanks.